Good afternoon, everyone. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you so much. I'm Tammy Welty, and I am our Director of Training and Communications here at Bradford & Barthel. I am having my 20th anniversary with Bradford & Barthel later this year, so I've been here for a few minutes. <laughs> I highly recommend that you check out our value-added services on our website at bradfordbarthel.com. Um, this is including uh, things like the b, b blog, where we release a couple of articles a week. You can find on our website our education and webinars page where you can watch previously recorded training for CE credit. I know a lot of you have your CE credits due in June, so if you need CE credits, go to our website. Uh, we have over 50 free CE videos you can watch uh, anytime. Uh, we also, on our website, and Tim might talk a little bit more about this, but we also have our AMA analysis and rating department. And we happen to have our entire rating department with us uh, today on this webinar, so they're going to be introducing themselves in just a second. So those are just a few things that you can find on our website, but there's much, much more, so go check out our website. Tim Musak is Bradford & Barthel's Director of AMA Analysis and Indemnity Evaluation. He is leading today's topic of rating multiple disabilities. I'm excited that we have our entire rating team here, and let's go ahead and get them started with introductions. Uh, Kenny, do you want to start us off? Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Kenny Tolbert, and I'm in the ratings department where I work with Susan and Tim. Uh, fun fact about me is I'm obsessed with caffeine, whether that be coffee or tea, which isn't exactly healthy. But uh, I'm glad to be here with you in this informative webinar. Uh, Rating multiple disabilities and applying apportionment, it can be tricky at times, but I think you're in good hands today with, with Tim, who is very experienced, and I think we'll give you some good information, so thank you. Hey, Susan. Hey, everybody. I'm Susan Kalias. Um, I've been in Bradford and Barthel about almost 11 years in July. Um, I'm in the rating department for a little over about three years. And before that, I was doing um, hearing rep work um, on liens, litigating liens. So, um, fun fact, gosh, we have this uh, leucistic scrub jay. He's pure white, and he hangs out with all the other blue scrub jays in the yard. And he started coming around right after the COVID pandemic started, when he was a fledgling. So he's two years old now. And really fun to watch. <laughs> I'm Tim Musak. I've been uh, starting work comp claims in 1988. Took my first PD rating class in 1989. Started teaching in 1991. I've been in Bradford and Barthel doing nothing but ratings and training since 2008. So I guess that puts me coming up 14 years uh, with Bradford and Barthel. Fun fact for me, I'm a skeptic. Um, eight, nine, ten years ago, when people started talking about 3D printers, I was skeptical. Um, I keep now a 3D printed little cup um, in my office as evidence that there really is such a thing as a 3D printer. So thank you all for joining us today. We're going to talk about permanent disability rating. We're going to talk specifically, we're going to get into the combined values chart, how to combine permanent disability and how to apply apportionment to permanent disability rating strengths. We're going to start with a couple of questions. Okay. Let's do our first poll. You should see it on your screen now. Uh, how many ratings have you completed since January? You have four choices there. Zero one to two, three to five, or six or more. I've been told that I go through these a little too quickly, so I'm gonna to try to give you guys a little bit longer this time. It feels like forever when you're waiting though. <laughs> so I'll give it a few more seconds. So how many ratings have you completed since January? Tim would like to know. He wants to see how many like ratings you're doing. <laughs> Okay, most of you have voted, about 74% of you, 75 now, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll in three seconds. Okay, Tim, I'm gonna share those results. It looks like it's all over the place. Do you okay. see those results? I am not seeing those this time. Okay, so 21% said zero, 18% okay. said one to two, 29% said three to five, and 32 said six or more. 
Okay, so we have a, a variety, a, a range of experience on this on this seminar today. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Poll number two on your screen now. What is the impairment number for carpal tunnel? You have four options there. Three that are real impairment numbers, I believe, and one that says none of the above. Yeah, those are real impairment numbers. You know, we're showing that almost 70% have responded, and thank you. This really is helpful to us. It, it really is. The, the correct answer, 40% uh, of you got it right, is 16.01.02.02. I'm going to use this as a teaching moment. It doesn't matter whether you knew this or didn't know this. I'm going to tell you how you know. Uh, the first two digits are the chapter number from the AMA guides. Chapter 15 covers the spine. Chapter 16 covers the upper extremities. Chapter 17 covers the lower extremities. So the first two digits tell you what chapter it came from. Carpal tunnel is in the upper extremities chapter. Thank you. Okay, final poll for now. Should be on your screen now. What occupational group number is most likely to be a sedentary job? What occupational group number is most likely to be a sedentary job? You could choose 120, 230, 380, or 460. And you guys are getting a lot faster, so I'm just gonna give us a few more seconds. 80% um, really like one option, Tim, but maybe three more seconds and I'll close this out and share the results with everyone. Okay, I'm gonna That's share great. those now. Again, we had 70% of you participated. Thanks so much. 120 is the correct answer. Again, I make it a teaching moment. A lot of you knew that. Um, the occupational group numbers, the first digit of the three digit occupational group number is, uh, tells you how physically active that job is, how physically much strength it needs. So a one is the least physical. That's somebody that's doing a sit down job. So they're not doing lifting, carrying, pushing, pulling. Okay, so there we go. We have three poll questions. Give me an idea where we're at. Um, we're going to start talking about permanent disability rating, how to use the permanent disability rating schedule. I'm going to go through that pretty briefly. Uh, Tammy mentioned our website, and we have a lot of webinars pre recorded on our website. One of them we have is beginning permanent disability rating. So if you're fairly new, or you want a refresher, that might be a good one for you. And as Tammy mentioned, uh, you, you get continuing education credits, which you gotta keep current. So maybe that's a good opportunity for you. That's a good topic for you to get to. I'm going to start now by um, getting away from the PowerPoint and we're gonna look at actual rating schedule. This is included in the um, handouts on, on our webinar page there, but I just want to show you it's a digital PDF version of the rating schedule, and it's quite useful, I think, if you don't have one that's really easy to keep at your desk because it's in your computer. But uh, goes through. I'm going to go through it. There's an introduction of the rating schedule. The rating schedule set up in order is the way you would do a rating, impairment numbers first. Um, then it, you can do the 1.4 modifier for 2013 injuries the FEC table for injuries before 2013, the three-piece occupational uh, adjustment process. And what I do want to show you is the last part of Section 3. If you have not actually looked in a rating schedule, uh, these, this is a great aid for figuring out occupational group numbers that are not represented in the rating schedule. For instance, um, if, if you don't have a truck driver, if you've got something that's not listed in there or you're not sure what the person does, this section of the occupational uh, group number piece, section three, the last part of section three, is really helpful in that regard in terms of coming up with a group number. It gives you an idea of that the beginning of it is instructions, um, it tells you the first digit is the strength designator. The second digit gives you some sense of an occupation. There's two pages, so it goes up to nine. And the third digit is, is just a, an additional modifier. 
So you can have something like 350 for a truck driver, 351 for a forklift driver, some, some change, but still a lot of the same elements of that job. Um, the age is in there as well. The age adjustments, they're, they're groups of uh, five years for age adjustments. And in the middle, 37 to 41 is, is average age of injured workers, the way it's considered. There's examples back here. There's a CVC um, chart in the back of the rating schedule. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna look at this today, the CVC table, and we're gonna look at the instructions specific to what they say about combining, because um, that's something that doctors sometimes get wrong, um, and sometimes a lot of people get wrong. So we're gonna go through where you can find the rules. You don't necessarily have to memorize any rules, know where to find them. A lot of them are in the, in the rating schedule, and we're gonna talk about where you can find some of them within the AMA guides as well. So I walked through the rating schedule, um, and what you need to do ratings, you need a date of birth and a date of injury, and you need both so that you can figure the age on date of injury. That's what we use to rate. It's age on date of injury, not age um, at the time of MMI or anything else, but age on date of injury. And you need the occupation at time of injury. From the medical report, you need to know what the injury was and the evaluation method. We're fortunate in that the rating schedule and the AMA guides, the current rating schedule and AMA guides came into existence at the same time. We already knew we were gonna use the AMA guides. So the administrative director was able to have the rating schedule created to fit the AMA guides. Our impairment numbers usually, usually we can find, find what fits and usually the doctor can find what fits from the AMA guides and, and we're able to rate it that way. We don't have to do a lot of guessing usually about what impairment number we're using. Uh, so the doctor gives us the impairment also that we use for the rating strings. Sometimes we disagree with them. We think they haven't done it uh, strictly by the AMA guys, but the doctor's the one that makes that determination. Um, and we use WPI, whole person impairment for rating strings. We don't use any other e evaluation um, scale. We use whole person impairment. Now, if, I'll go further into that in a little bit. Being able to rate helps you reserve and helps you pay PD benefits. I want to look at um, another thing that we, we included in the, uh, in the uh, handout section was the money chart. So with the money chart, something to remember is that the values might might change. They've changed over the years. They've been consistent since 2014. But if you're dealing with the date of entry that's prior to 2014, it might be different. You, you want to look at that. So it's the percentage corresponds to a number of weeks and then the permanent disability amount. For all of these money charts that we have and every other, every other company that puts money charts out, they're all doing the dollar amount is based on maximum PD rates. They're, they're not, not on anything less because you can't do everything. So maximum PD rates are what these include. So at this point in time, with minimum wage having increased, if a person's working full time, they're probably a maximum wage earner for permanent disability. But if it's a part-time employee, then you, you should investigate what the wages are and the total PD might change, but the weeks do not. I wanna, I wanna really reinforce that. The weeks are associated with the percentage and then that weeks times the rate will give you the PD value. Within this money chart, we have other things. We have the maximum minimums going back a ways for permanent disability, for temporary disability. We've got state average weekly wage with COLA applications. Um, going back away. We have current life expectancy, the Office of Self-Insurance Plans for reserving for 2022, we need to use this. We need to use the 2018 U.S. Life Table because that's the most current U.S. Life Table and that's what they use, the most current U.S. Life Table. So for reserving, this is the life expectancy you need to work with. Life pensions, 
there's a different maximum rate for life pensions if these rates again are all based on maximum if a person was making less than 515 a week life pension rate is going to be less than what shows along this column uh, mileage rates, all, all kinds of good stuff there. So here we go, back to paying permanent disability benefits, the average weekly earnings, statutory minimums and maximums, you need to know that stuff. That stuff is in our is in anybody's money chart. Ours is right there, you can download it, have it on your computer and it's ready to go. Paying permanent disability benefits, I'm getting a little bit out of my, my uh, lane with of ratings, but permanent disability is starts to accrue at MMI or end of temporary total disability, whichever comes first. Uh, PD should be paid by law uh, at the at when temporary disability stops, unless that person has gone back to work at that same employment with a not necessarily the same employment with a an appropriate job offer to the same employer. Um, and you should pay. Um, I'm going to leave that one out there. Talk to your attorneys about that. You, you want to pay a reasonable amount based on your assessment of permanent disability. You have to estimate and make some payments. And we do have a session on estimating PD if you wanted to look at that sometime in the future. Talk to your, talk to your office about that. Medical information that you need for evaluating and rating permanent disability. The objective findings that the doctor documents on exam and finds on exam should lead the doctor to the correct AMA guides chapter. If you're evaluating the spine, you go to chapter 15. Um, the method of evaluation, the doctor should be able to find the correct table, should be able to find the correct class, correct category, and, and then there's some, some judgment within those areas. But the AMA guides is, is tries to, to channel into, into values, depending on the significance of the injury on a, on a fairly objective basis. So the doctor's got some discretion, but the AMA guides are indeed the guides and they should get the doctor, the doctor should be using the right chapter and the right table and objective findings should help determine the correct class. The instructions within the rating schedule um, it tells you it tells you how to do it. This is all in part one, section one of the rating schedule. The impairment number. It says to choose the closest applicable impairment number. You can usually find one. The first two digits are the chapter number. If it's an Almarez Guzman assessment by the doctor, you use nine nine for the last two digits. For example, on this particular slide shows for headaches, the DEU has assigned 13.01.00.99. That's kind of a standardized Almers guzman assessment for headaches, which is not given WPI specifically in the AMA guides, or I mean, in the, yeah, in the AMA guides. Um, I'm gonna flip through this. Actually, I'm gonna stop right here. Page 110 of the rating schedule, if you're fairly new at ratings, page 110 walks through a rating string. Um, and so if you're fairly new, this, this is a, a good resource to kind of help you understand what you're doing. It's step by step through the schedule and this tells you about it. So that's page 110 of the rating schedule. Um, again, 99 for the last two digits. Occupation I talked about that I believe is a really helpful, useful, I use it a lot actually. Section, at the end of section three, about helping find occupational group numbers for things that are not listed in the rating schedule and sometimes confirming those that are listed in the rating schedule by title. Um, because the, the title isn't always enough, you gotta do your investigations and find out what the person does. But here we're gonna talk about combined values chart. Uh, the instructions in the rating schedule say to, it's section eight, so the rating schedule tells us the formula. The instructions are, if you're put, I'll back up just a little bit. Anytime you put two numbers together, when you're doing ratings and work comp, you're either adding or you're combining. They do not mean the same for ratings. Um, adding is you add it. Combining means you put them together based on this formula 
which ensures that you never get over 100%. It reduces each subsequent at inclusion, each subsequent number down that so you're not just adding, it's reducing it a little bit from adding, and you can't get over 100%. Uh, the instructions are to combine largest to smallest, and you're and uh, with permanent disability, the instruction within the rating schedule are to combine PD for a single extremity first, and then go largest to smallest. So we're going to go through examples with that today. Uh, we do the right arm, we do the left arm, we do the right leg, we do the left leg, and then then you combine largest to smallest. You know, always round to a whole number at each step. We don't want fractions. We don't want decimals. We round to a whole number every step of the way in doing permanent disability rating. So page 111 of the rating schedule gives the specific instructions as single part of an extremity, two impairments involving a shoulder would be combined at the upper extremity impairment level. So this from page 111 of the rating schedule is something that a number of doctors seem to be unaware of. And so they may convert and combine whole persons. The, the most frequent example I can think of with shoulders, if a shoulder injury, um, a doctor may have a rotator cuff tear, a surgery is done and included in that surgery is what's called a Mumford procedure which includes a distal clavicle resection, some shaving off the end of the, of the clavicle. Um, and that's considered an arthroplasty. And there is uh, an impairment, an automatic impairment for that. It's 10% upper extremity or 6% whole person. So a person might have that along with some loss of motion. The correct way to put those together would be to combine at the 10% upper extremity impairment value for the arthroplasty, the distal clavicle resection, and then whatever the range of motion impairment is at the extremity. Some doctors will combine to whole person each one and then can combine and then, then combine, they'll convert and then combine. And, and that's not correct. The larger the numbers, the more likely that's going to be incorrect. The smaller numbers may end up the same, but it, that's not the correct way. Impairments, here's the second instruction on page 111. An individual extremity are adjusted and combined at the whole person level. So once you get to the rating string completed and you get to permanent disability, you combine an extremity first. And the reason that's important to consider and to remember that we only rate whole person impairment because the AMA guides give different values in different chapters. And that's to make it so doctors can be more precise in their evaluation method. So for instance, in the, in the uh, most of the chapters, the impairment is given in whole person impairment values. Um, but when you get to Chapter 16, the upper extremities, the values are different. Usually the figures and tables in chapter 16 differ. You're usually getting an upper extremity impairment value, except for if you're dealing with fingers and you're getting finger values for impairments in those figures and tables. And, and, they're, and they differ. The thumb is worth a certain amount. These two fingers are worth a different amount. And these two fingers are worth a different amount. So it's important important for a doctor to, to recognize that and get it to whole person impairment. And, it, and it's important for us to recognize we're rating whole person impairment. We're not going to rate thumb, 40% of the thumb. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get that converted down to whole person and rate it as whole person. Similarly, with the lower extremity, chapter 17, 40% WPI is maximum for a leg. So 100% of a lower extremity is 40% whole person. Most of the figures and tables in chapter 17 are in lower extremity values. So those need to be converted to WPI eventually so that they can be rated. So something to keep in mind for both of those chapters, 16 and 17, you wanna make sure you're getting the whole person impairment value before you do your ratings. Um, 
I'm going to skip and keep going along here. Combined ads, so I talked about combining and adding. Um, most of the time when you're putting numbers together in WordComp, you're combining uh, rather than adding. Most of the time. The, the most notable exception, if you're looking at range of motion for the same part of the body, then you're adding. Uh, the tables are constructed with values that consider that you're going to be adding rather than combining. So, for instance, the shoulder, there's six different motions on three different figures within Chapter 16 for evaluating loss of motion of the shoulder. Each of those impairment values for each of those six motions are going to be obtained at upper extremity value. Those would all be added and then converted to whole person impairment. I hope that made sense. Um, we add range of motion for the same part of the body. There is one exception to that, and that's when we're looking at multiple fingers, uh, when you're dealing with the fingers, which is its own set of rules. And if you're doing those own set of rules, if you're looking at multiple digits or multiple impairments for a hand, it's a good idea to just look at the instructions. Figure 16-1A walks through it. Um, and it's all put in a narrative on page, narrative summary on page 511 of the AMA guide. So if you're doing something to remember, if you've got multiple digits, check the instructions. Um, it's not something you need to memorize. There, there are really a lot of different instructions that don't fit anything else in terms of rating. So you want to check those and do that. Uh, uh, follow the instructions, page 511 or the figure 16-1A the, towards the beginning of the chapter. We find that most doctors um, struggle with that and make mistakes. So we, we also recommend that you, you, you look at those, review the doctor's work um, when you're looking at multiple digits for a hand. Um, so now we're gonna go specifically right into chapter 15 and the spine. I'm going to talk about specifics about when you add and when you combine. Um, there's there's not any table in, in the AMA guides that says you combine these things, you add these things. We're, I mean, we're going to kind of look at a couple of things. Chapter 15 of the, the spine, we add. Um, most of the time it doesn't come up. If you're looking at the DRE method, the diagnosis related estimate, the single value is whole person. You take that whole person value and you rate it. So it's a pretty straightforward process for the DRE method. And the DRE method should cover 90% of the spine injuries out there, 95%. And, and that's real straightforward. When you're looking at the range of motion method, that's when it gets more complex. It's more complex for the doctors. It's more complex for, for us as, to rate and for you to rate. Table 15.7 covers one element of the spine range of motion method. There's three elements to the range of motion method. The spinal disorder, that table itself tells you to add the different values you might take from table 15.7, um, and, and usually you're adding different values. There's more than one element that you're looking at there on that table. But the instructions within the table tell you to add. Um, and what I mean by table 15.7 and the elements there, maybe you're looking at a two-level lumbar fusion. There is a specific value for the lumbar fusion. There's another add-on for that second level. Um, and that's included in the instructions are included within the table. Range of motion, the actual loss of motion of the spine is an element of the range of motion method. You add range of motion of the same part of the body. So for the lumbar spine, there's four different motions. You may have impairment in each of those four. Those would be added. Combine for the spine, if you've got the range of motion method, those two elements get combined and that gets rated, adjusted. That whole person value then gets adjusted as a range of motion method evaluation for the spine. So, and um, 
the final part, the third element of the range of motion method for the spine, you've got upper, if you have a cervical spine, you might have upper extremity nerve disorder, nerve deficits. The values for that table are in upper extremity. You would combine if there's multiple nerves affected. Same with lumbar spine and lower extremity. You would combine if there's multiple nerves affected. So uh, that's in a nutshell, that's kind of sort of what, what chapter 15 tells us to do. Evaluating range of motion of the spine is, is relatively complex. We do have a, a uh, PowerPoint online for that as well. And you're welcome to look at that. So with the spine range of motion, you may have as many as four WPI values because the spinal nerve deficits, sensory and motor, we have separate impairment numbers for those, so they would be rated separately. So we could have four WPI values and three different ratings. So it gets a little complex to the range of motion method. Um, but I'm going to go through an example here and. I think um, this one, lumbar spine range of motion. If, for instance, you had 13% WPI for the loss of motion, 13% WPI from table 15.7, which you got there by adding, um, those would be combined and rated together. I'm giving an example here. 56-year-old uh, roofer, we would be looking at rating it like this. And what I'm doing for nerve deficits, there's no rateable impairment in this example. I made up an example. So this is how the lumbar spine range of motion method would be rated with this data, 13% WPI, 13% WPI combines to 24%, the two elements of the range of motion method. And then that gets adjusted. You see, we've got the 24%. And that gets adjusted for the 56-year-old uh, roofer. No rateable impairment for sensory deficit. No rateable impairment for motor deficit. I just wanted to show you that the impairment numbers are different. There are different impairment numbers. That's from the rating schedule. Why we did that, I don't know. But this is what we did. If this is everything you've got for this injury, you combine. And that's all you got, 46% total PD. So with that, we're going to go for a couple of more questions here, a couple more poll questions. And Tammy? I am here, and it Thank should you. already be on your screen. Uh, which California Labor Code addresses apportionment? Do you know? You have four options there again. 3600, 3501, 4664, or 5405. So again, which California labor code addresses apportionment? That's what Tim wants to know now. He's really challenging you all today, huh? <laughs> We're gonna talk about apportionment. And it's not important that you know which number it is. I just wanna get an idea. And I'll tell you what the, what the other ones are. So okay, there's your, there's your percent, we got 23, okay. So labor code 3600 talks about compensable injury. What makes a compensable injury? Labor Code 3501 talks about dependents relative to a death claim. Who's a dependent and who isn't in terms of eligibility for benefits. 4664 is one of the two labor codes that addresses apportionment. Labor Code 5405 is statute of limitations. You don't need to know any of these. You don't ever have to know labor codes. Um, it, it's good to be aware of them, but we're, in terms of apportionment, we know 4663 and 4664 cover apportionment. I don't know the others. I looked them up specific to, to, to draw up some additional questions here on that. So thank you for that one. And we have one more. Oh, and I got to show something here first. Oh, okay. I'll wait. Okay. And now you can do that. Using, using this combined values chart from the rating schedule. The okay. next question. So using that combined values chart that he just showed you in your permanent disability rating schedule, um, what is the result of combining 25 and 15? 
you guys are fast. Some of you already know. So is it 38, 36, 34, or none of the above? So go to that combined values chart, combine 25 and 15, and what does it give you? I'm assuming it's not 40 since that's not one of the options. <laughs> <laughs> we don't add, we combine apparently. True, we're combining. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close it out in three seconds. It looks like a bunch of you are still voting. So just a few more seconds here. It takes a second to look that up. So I don't wanna rush you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. You, you ready for me to close it? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready, ready for you to close it. Here. But the, the answer is 36. And, and if you haven't seen the combined values chart, this is in section eight of the rating schedule. It starts on eight dash two. The way you use it, you're putting two numbers together. You're taking the greatest number down the left-hand column. It tells, here's the direction. Combine any two, get the larger value on the left side and the smaller value at the bottom. So we're looking at 25 and going across to 15 and we find 36 is the, is the answer for that. So that's the combining. So that's how you use this table. Piece of cake. Um, takes practice and a straight edge. I, I always <laughs> have to double check myself and, and use a straight edge. But that's the combined values chart at the end of the rating schedule and you need to use it. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. We're going to talk about apportionment now, and I'm going a little slower than than I thought I would, but so I'm going to talk a little bit more quickly. Um, we're we're going to get a little bit more complex. Um, so those of you that are less experienced, I hope you don't uh, feel frustrated. Um, find something that you can latch on to, and 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 let's go. We're we're going to look at apportionment. We big change in apportionment in 2005 going along with the AMA guides. Let's use the AMA guide. So Labor Code 4663 um, says a, a doctor's report must include an apportionment determination, must tell what's caused by the direct result of the injury. Well, that's all stuff we, we should know. Caused by other factors, both before and subsequent to the industrial injury. So the doctor is supposed to talk about what causes this, this permanent disability? The injury, is there anything else? This is talking about other factors. Are there other factors? That's how we kind of shortcut referencing this labor code. 4663 is other factors. One of the things I find interesting about this labor code is it says, upon request, the injured worker must disclose all previous permanent disabilities and physical impairments. So we want the doctor to ask that. Um, maybe we put that in our letter to the doctor, our cover letter to the doctor. Please be sure to ask about these things because they've got to tell you. Um, that's that's the way it's supposed to work. So that's other factors apportionment. And then we got Labor Code 4664. And this addresses uh, prior awards. Most specifically, the employer shall only be liable for caused by this injury. If there's a prior award, it shall be conclusively presumed that that prior permanent disability still exists. And conclusively presumed means it's there. There's no argument about it. It's it's there. And I think we've got a question. Yeah, we have a question from Tammy, which is um, on apportionment, shouldn't a 63-year-old with degenerative disc disease have apportionment? I would think so, but not every doctor agrees with me. Um, and and it should uh, kind of depend on how other activities that that 63 year old has and other medical conditions that that 63 year old might or might not have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to look at these two labor codes and how do we apply them and how do we do? We're going to look at combining and applying apportionment pre permanent disability rating so that we're coming up with a, a, an appropriate estimate, appropriate value for uh, uh, for what we're supposed to reserve and what we're supposed to pay. So I'm going to show you, we're going to talk about first, how do we apply apportionment? Let, let's say we've got that lumbar spine injury, that one we just rated for that 417 2019 date of injury is 46% PD. We went through that rating for the range of motion method. But lo and behold, this individual had a prior award for the lumbar spine that was 25% PD. 
and this is how it rated out. I'm showing you that he was only 50 years old at the time of that prior 2013 injury. Um, and it rated 25% PD. So how do we apply that prior award? This is how we apply that prior award. We take that 46% PD now that we just rated and we subtract that prior PD, 25% PD. So 21% PD is what you're paying for that new injury, April 17th, 2019. Getting prior awards is really helpful and really important in terms of applying apportionment. If there's a prior award you think there might be, find it, find it. What we see is we see that over the years, um, people have gotten better attorneys and claims folks and have gotten better about putting the actual strings in the awards so you know what was associated with what so um if if the award is 25 percent for a lumbar spine you get a subtractive no there's no argument there's no winnable argument um you get a subtractive and that's that's how you do it that's the conclusion of the rating you take the per and you're subtracting the permanent disability you're not subtracting wpi you're subtracting permanent disability at the conclusion of the rating, the occupation age adjustment. Okay, we're gonna look at chapter 16. I think we've got another question, that's good. Yeah, from Marianne, it's, uh, what if the prior award was from an older schedule? Uh, if it's from the older schedule, then you have some different proof. Uh, the burden of proof is on defense to prove overlap. If it's a rating under the AMA guides, that burden of proof is met. Um, if it's the old schedule, you got you can't just subtract the PD. You got two choices. <laughs> you can ask the doctor to go to the other factors, the 4663, and that prior award probably translates to about 30% of the current PD. Or you'd get the medical report upon which that prior award was based, and you have a doctor. You don't need a doctor. Actually, there's case law that says you don't need a doctor. You need somebody that can rate using the AMA guides. Rate that based on the documentation in the report using the age and occupation at the time of that prior injury. So you got two choices, but you can't subtract a 97 or an 88 um, PDRS rating directly. You've got to you've got to go through an additional step. That disability is still there, but you got to to prove overlap. You got to go through a di an additional step. Great question, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you. For adding combining CVCs, range of motion, the upper extremity, add range of motion, the same body part. You uh, you add strength for the same joint. You can kind of tell that by looking at the uh, looking at the table. If the different values add up to over 100, you're, you're gonna be combining. If they don't, maybe not. Uh, there's exception, I talked about the, the evaluation of hands, multiple digits, you're not necessarily just adding. So follow the instructions in the AMA guides. They're, they're a little bit convoluted for hands, multiple digits. Page 511 or 161A figure there. Uh, so I'm gonna show an example. Combine, here we go, another piece. You combine for peripheral nerve injury, for example, carpal tunnel, there may be sensory and motor deficit impairments. You combine those at the upper extremity impairment level and then convert the whole person impairment to rate carpal tunnel. I hope that made sense. Um, you combine impairments from separate methods I looked at that earlier, that instruction from page 111 of the rating schedule. Um, separate methods of evaluation of the same potty parts, including digits. Um, and um, you combine them at that value at which you're, you're dealing, dealing with. That doesn't make sense what I just said, but if you're looking at upper extremity values from the figures for the shoulder, you're combining upper extremity. For the digits, you may be looking at loss of motion at digit value. You may be looking at sensory deficit at digit value. If it's for the same finger, you're combining at the digit value before you do all the converting to get it to whole person. So it can be kind of complex. Doing digits can be 
can be complex. Don't do the first one you see on your own. Get someone to take a look with you, okay? Um, and that's where you go for it. One thing I want to point out in the AMA guides that throw some doctors off, figure 16.1b in chapter 16 to instructs the doctors to do, if they're doing an arm other than the fingers, uh, to do a total upper extremity impairment um, total for everything on that arm. We don't do that in California. Other jurisdictions, they do. They're, an extremity is worth a certain number of weeks, so they want a percentage of the extremity. 46% of the extremity gets, if that's an easier, an easier um, method for evaluating an extremity injury. We don't. We rate each part of the extremity separately. We rate the shoulder. We rate the elbow. We rate the wrist. We rate the hand. Those, those could all get rated separately. So we don't follow that instruction. And, and again, sometimes some of the doctors get uh, follow this instruction, so they're not intentionally trying to throw us off. They're following the instructions in the AMA guides, and we sometimes need to back it out and say, okay, well, this much is for the shoulder, this much is for the elbow, this much is for the wrist, and so on. This is the figure 16-1A for the fingers, multiple multiple digits for a hand, and the instructions are in there. They're not the clearest, but if you if um, if you try to go through it step by step, it gives the instructions. Don't do the first one by yourself. Uh, figure 16-1B, also from the AMA guides. This is the one that tells the doctor to give them a regional impairment of the upper extremity to combine the wrist and the elbow and the shoulder. Um, and we don't do that. Then you combine the, the nerve system, vascular, vascular system and such. We don't do that. We're, we're dealing each part of that upper extremity separately. Um, so we're gonna go through an example here. We've got a question. Yeah. Um, is, that, is, is there any update on whether California will adopt the sixth edition of the guide, even though the sixth edition will yield less for injured workers? There is nothing current that I'm aware of. Um, last thing I read a couple years ago was <laughs> it's not going to be anytime soon. And that's part of the reason is because it's it's less. It, it rates less. And the other reason is doctors struggle learning the fifth edition. There'll be errors all over again if we go to a sixth edition. I mean, not trying to be critical, but that, that's just the reality. And we'll all make mistakes on it once we, if we switch from six edition. So there's nothing current in plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do a carpal tunnel example, 56 year old sale maker. Let's say the doctor says 25% sensory loss or carpal tunnel, that's the median nerve. The values, 10% um, upper extremity is what that turns into, 25% sensory loss times the maximum value. So 10% upper extremity um, is what the assessment is for carpal tunnel in this case. We don't rate the 10% upper extremity. We're rating, we convert it to whole person, that's 6% whole person. And that gets rated like that. There's a specific impairment number for carpal tunnel. Uh, right shoulder example we're going to look at. I talked a little bit about this, a distal clavicle resection, uh, so there's some motion loss, and let's say the doctor gives some pain. There's instructions in the rating schedule, page 112, what to do with pain. So what we would do, we would add the impairment for motion loss, adds up to 8% upper extremity. We take the distal clavicle resection from table 1627 as 10% upper extremity. We combine those at the extremity value. Um, it's 10%, 17% upper extremity. Converts to, now we convert it to whole person. And then we add the pain, the 2% pain in whole person. And that goes, that's how we do it. That two, the pain gets added to the whole person before the rating. I want to just point that out, before the rating. Um, and I also want to point out this impairment number um, for the shoulder, it's chapter 16, 02 says it's the shoulder. If there's more than one method, range of motion, it would be 01. 02 says other. If it's more than one method, you're going to use other. 
breath because sometimes it makes a difference with the impairment number. This one, I think I offered some apportionment. 20% was non-industrial, 80% related to this specific injury. So that's how we apply apportionment. This is in other factors, Labor Code 4663 apportionment. So 0.8 times the 25, after we do the string, is 25% PD. 0.8 times that gives you 20% PD after apportionment. So this, that's how you do uh, apportionment, the other factors. You, you don't do it to the to the uh, WPI. Some doctors do that for us, thinking they're helping out. Um, we're, we're taking it after we do the rating strain. Chapter 17, when do we add, when do we combine? We add range of motion for the same body part, uh, a, a continuous theme throughout the AMA guides. We combine atrophy, strength, arthritis, peripheral nerves. It doesn't come right out and say that. You got to, sometimes you have to go through the examples and they tell you what they're doing. But you combine atrophy, strength, arthritis, and peripheral nerve impairment. Um, when you're combining chapter 17, table 17, 2 tells you which ones you can and cannot combine when you get different methods. There's all lots of different methods for rating the lower extremity. Table 17, 2 looks kind of like this, and it tells you which ones you can and cannot combine. So an open box says you combine. An X means you cannot. Um, I am running out of time. I'm going to go through a lower extremity example. Uh, I just want to show you what that looks like. I got a lot of stuff going on on this one, but I kind of want to walk through it. So this one, the left knee, there's tears and repair for the ACL and the CCL, the anterior cruciate ligament and the collateral cruciate ligament. And the doctor says there's moderate laxity. That's in table 1733. It's a 25% lower extremity value. There's also arthritis. The doctor gives you the objective findings and goes to table 1731. That's another 20% LE for arthritis. Table 17.2 says we can combine the DBE method, table 1733, with arthritis from 1733 or 1731. We combine at the extremity impairment level. So we combine 25 and 20, you get 40% LE and then convert to whole person. Doctors are more inclined to convert to whole person and then combine the 10 and the eight will get you a lesser number um, uh, or give you a greater WPI, it turns into 17% WPI and it rates ends up being 37% PD. So combine at the extremity impairment level and adjust it and a portion applied at the end. Um, we have four minutes left. I'm going to um, go to one final example. If I can figure out where I have it here. Yeah, I'm gonna go to slide uh, 52 here. So I'm skipping a bit. Um, and I'm looking at this. So I've got a whole bunch of stuff going on here, but what what I want to point out is on this one, apportionment and how that's applied. So we're looking at all these. Let's say these are all for the same injury. What do we do? We're taking that lumbar spine. We rated it out. We had a prior award, so we subtract it. We had right carpal tunnel, right shoulder. There's apportionment for the right shoulder. We apply that after the rating string. We get a left knee and apportionment. We apply that after the rating string. We got a left ankle. We got a right hip and we got some apportionment. And not only do we have non-industrial apportionment, we have two different injuries. And I'm gonna just kind of go through this. So that's all for the same injury. We do each extremity. That's the point I wanna make here. So we're doing the right arm. There were two different parts of the right arm that were injured in this injury. We combined those first, the carpal tunnel and the shoulder. The left leg, we had the knee and the ankle, both from the left leg. We combined those first. Then we go largest to smallest using that combined values chart. After, and we're, this is after apportionment's been applied. And in this particular one, 
uh, the, the additional quirk I put in there was you have a specific and a CT both for the right hip along with the non-industrial. So I had a lot going on in there. Um, I was hoping I would be able to lead up to that a little bit better, but I kind of crammed more in here than I probably should have. Uh, but anyway, the point I want to make, we do the extremity first, each extremity first. If there's more than one part of an extremity, after you get to the PD, you're combining that first and then wherever it fits within the um, uh, go largest to smallest using that combined values chart. Okay, so combine or add, they don't mean the same. Um, I wanted to talk about kites. Some doctors will say they think it should be added. There's no binding case law on that. I, I, I would question it anytime a doctor tells you that's what they think should happen. So I think we have a question and Tammy to tell me that I'm done. So the question <laughs> first. <laughs> um, just a question about a pain add-on. I think it's, uh, uh, how do we, uh, sorry. Uh, what do we do when the doctor adds an impairment for pain? I think without identifying a specific. Well, that, it, it's a, that's a great question. Um, most DEU raters, and I say most, I saw one that distributed it. Most DEU raters will take it and assign it to the one that seems to make most sense to the body part that has most sense. I saw one distributed to three different body parts, but most DEU raters will take the one that seems to make the most sense, maybe the most significant injury. Um, and so that's kind of what we do. Um, uh, the options go back and ask the doctor, uh, but the DU will just do that. They'll rate it. And... Okay. Okay. So we talked a lot. I talked a lot. Combined values chart and apportionment. Oh, I'm... and Tammy's got some wrap up for us. I do. Thank you so much, Tim. Isn't he wonderful, everybody? We're so lucky to have him. Thank you so much for teaching us for an hour today, Tim. And if you have more questions for Tim, um, he's available a lot of the time. I, won't, I don't wanna say all the time, but he's available most of the time. <laughs> His contact information is up there on your screen. And if you wanna send a rating to our rating department, you can send that to ratings at bradfordbarthel.com. Um, and at that email address, you will reach Kenny, uh, Susan and Tim. So they'll all three be on that email if you need something from our ratings department. And I just want to thank you all again for being with us today. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you spending an hour with us. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you very much.